Uh, it is great to, to be here. I actually wanted to be down there sitting at a table, but I was told in terms of lighting, uh, I need to be here. Um, so, how can I compare Jesus? It's like a little girl that is lost in the woods. She walks in the woods, she is scared, uh, she has nobody to take care of her. Uh, she wanders around and as she walks and as she is filled with fear, uh, there's this older man that walks by and she remembers that her parents had told her, do not trust grown up people just walking out of some clearing. And yet when that man comes to her, she is filled with an overwhelming sense of trust. Something puts her at rest. And this man takes her by her hand and starts to tell her a story about a castle and about a people in that castle who who care for each other in a wonderful way. There is, a, there is love among them, there is caring for each other, there is respect for each other. Uh, the people in that castle, they try to help each other develop their gifts and their uh, strengths, their abilities. And uh, he tells her all kinds of details about that castle. And the more he tells her, the more she gets um, put at rest. She feels she's in good hands. And as they walk, they come to a clearing. And there's a huge panorama that opens up before them. And in the distance, still hazy a little bit, uh, you can make out a castle. And as they walk closer towards that castle, people come running towards them. And they say, the king is back. The king is back. Wow, wonderful, the king is back. Um, the little girl is overwhelmed because she realizes what you're just realizing, that she was brought back out of the woods by the king of the castle. So what just happened? What did you just experience? What just happened? This is not a question of the story, it's stepping out of the story. What happened? Yeah? I gave you a parable, and in that parable there was a story, so that's a little complicated. We're not going to go into the, you know, that part, but gave you a parable, so what was the parable like? How would you describe the parable? I know that you're here for lunch, you're still thinking about <laughs> your books that you're doing and work, this is really hard. Um, okay, good. So what you did is, is wonderful. You are, are already processing what we've called a parable, and you're trying to draw meaning out of that. And I'm, I'm going to encourage us to wait with that just a little bit uh, as we go into the parables of Mark, as we try to wrestle with some of that. But that's, you are pointing to the moral of the story. You're pointing to the aim. This story has something to say. I wanted to communicate something to you. I didn't just want to entertain you and you then feel, wow, that, you know, I'm a terrible storyteller, but at least you, you know, you paid attention to it. So this is, what you're saying is where we're going. Let's wait a little bit. I told you a parable, but what did I tell you? 
Yeah. Okay. Why are you captivated? Wonderful. Uh, you mentioned the word parable. You already gave us a technical term. Can we all agree that it was a story? So we, we're going to get away a little bit from the technicality. And you are saying now, the story gets me involved. I mean, I could have pontificated here, given you definitions of parable, genre, etc. Some of you would have glazed over and you would have thought, mm, man, what's this afternoon? What I still have to do? But you are saying you were involved, so stories involve. They get you right in there. And in fact, you said more than that. Were you just following me intellectually? So, and you had another thing, and that is that I, without intent, associated with something in your life that is very significant in your life that maybe if I had given you definitions on parables, I would not have associated with. So that's kind of a fringe benefit from me. But you are saying you were involved with your mind and your, your heart or your emotions, your, your values, your fears. And so that's, we're very much in the center of storytelling and of Jesus' storytelling that he is not seeking to just appeal to our minds, but he's seeking to get us as a whole person, get us involved in the story. Uh, very good. Uh, anything else? So we're saying story, we're saying that's very involving, personally involving. What else would you say? What else happened here? Do you, do you remember how I started? The very first words. I mean, I thought about them driving here. How am, how am I going to say this? You remember? Does anybody remember what I said? The very first words. <laughs> this was nearly a formula that Jesus uses when he says, to what shall I compare the rule of God? How he rules. How can I capture that? for you to engage with your mind and heart. So you're precisely right. Uh, now, obviously, you are still calming down and, you know, things are lost. But that's how I introduced the story to say, give you a signal. I'm going to tell you a story, but the story, and that's where you already went so well, the story is trying to give you something about something else. The story is important. You follow it. But it really aims at something else, and that's where we're back with parables. Some stories, we may simply say, they're trying to involve us, and they're trying to leave us there in this involvement. But parables, these stories, they have a clear intent of looking beyond. I'm telling you that for something else. And that's why parable interpretation is so intriguing, but also so difficult, because you're not only supposed to understand and get involved in the story, you are to figure out what's the point of it? What is intended with that? Um, some of you have a little handout. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, go into that uh, briefly. Uh, this is what I think Jesus does with stories, with parable stories. He develops a image, he develops a uh, co concept. He develops a um, picture and then he goes into it. Look at me for a second. What did I just do? I entered a building. That's what Jesus does. That's the amazing thing. 
I think that's a phenomenon in the storytelling of Jesus, that he tells stories and then he enters them. For instance, in Mark, there's a story of the wicked tenants or the wicked husbandmen or the tenants, uh, the parable in Mark 12. Jesus says, uh, uh, there was once an owner who had a vineyard, and uh, he was supposed to get some, re some, feed, uh, some reward from that, some uh, pr produce, uh, some payoff. Sometimes these uh, landowners got maybe 30, 40, sometimes even 50%, so you have a, a justice issue in that. So it was a landowner, he had some claims on it. And uh, the people who, who worked the land, they didn't, they didn't give his part, they didn't pay his part. And so he sent various servants of his. And at the end, Jesus says, the owner sent his son. And then the tenants said, if we kill him, we have the vineyard. Now that's a perfect story that Jesus enters because he uses the metaphor, the image of vineyard, which is known to Jewish people as a reference, a picture for Israel. Israel as the vineyard, Isaiah 5. And God is the vineyard owner. He, he uh, tends to it. He, try, he, he does everything possible in Isaiah 5 to make that vineyard grow and produce fruit. Somehow this vineyard that Jesus talks about in this uh, uh, parable, in this story, may bear fruit, but it's not given to the owner. And so Jesus tells that story, and what happens after Mark 12? He enters it. He is the son of the owner of the vineyard of the people of God, and he enters it. He comes to the temple, and he knocks on the door and says, where is the fruit of prayer? Where is the fruit of devotion to God? And he doesn't find it. He, see, he finds a bunch of commercial activity. So that's one example. The Good Samaritan is another story. Uh, we could spend hours just on the story of the Good Samaritan in terms of the sociological, uh, the, the race issue, the ethnicity issue in that story. But simply to say, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan and then he does that, before and after. So this is one thing that we can find um, that Jesus draws pictures and then he enters them. Um, uh, I have here a brief definition of what a parable is. You use the technical term for that. Uh, the Hebrew would be mashal. And some of you, when you hear the word parable, you may think of something very specific, um, very literarily specific. Mashal is a very broad term in the Jewish mindset that simply says, I use figures of speech. I use images. I use stories. And Jesus is known to be an amazing storyteller, image user. Uh, Jesus used about in the Gospels, we have about 30% uh, parable or image material. Uh, so Jesus uses that in a very, very rich way. And mashal can be a, sim a little simile. Um, you know, the French existentialists would compare today's reign to the sadness of the soul of having lost a girl or boyfriend. Um, little simile, a little comparison between rain and the rain in your heart. Um, all the way to major allegories. Those would be metaphor chain, chains. Those would be stories with multiple significances, like the parable of the sower that Jesus himself interprets. It's perhaps the fundamental parable. If you don't understand the parable of the sower, you won't understand anything in Jesus' uh, storytelling. So you have all kinds of different forms, and part of our problem of interpreting the stories and the parables of Jesus is how do we approach them? How do we deal with them? We may underinterpret them, we may overinterpret them because like the little story I told you in the beginning, you may want to draw multiple analogies. You already did a little bit because you found yourself in that story. So 
that's the question before us, and I'm going to try and wrestle with that just a little bit as we uh, proceed. So that's basically Jesus uses mashal. Jesus uses figurative speech. Jesus uses imagery, stories for the purpose of drawing his audience in. Now, another little question. Will you forget the story I told you in the beginning? Will that be easy to remember or hard to remember? Easy. That's one other part. Jesus was an excellent educator, and he embedded things in their mind. They, they had to wrestle with it. Uh, scripture sometimes says, chew it, eat it, eat the book, eat the parable, chew it, work it, until you get what was intended here. So uh, that's, a, that's a rich reason. We, we can say much more about it, but in terms of definition, then we have images that point to something else. Some of these images are very complicated. They are stories, long stories, with multiple uh, points of uh, connection. Now, uh, I have a second point here, and that is interpreting parables, interpreting these stories, and we could talk a lot about that. I have two major points here that I'd like for you to think about. First, study the story. Don't necessarily try to find out what's the meaning of the story. Just study the story. Some of us uh, do that easily. We may be an English literature major, or we love literature, or we enjoy working with words, and we just love, how is this story put together? What kind of words are used? Uh, but I think for all of us, that's a really important thing. And what I'm suggesting here in this little outline is look at the beginning and the end of the story. Did you notice with the story I told you, the beginning had a key that got you into a certain slot. I'm trying to compare Jesus to something. Important signal. And at the end, when I said, they came and said, the king is back, I gave you an inside story understanding of the person, uh, of, of who, who that person is acting as in the story. So beginning and end are very important, and maybe before the beginning, which is the literary context. I'll throw that out. What's the literary context of the parable of the Good Samaritan? What's the context within which that story functions in Luke? I, I think I gave the uh, reference here in Luke 10. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you see how this uh, reference, who is my neighbor, and then comes the parable of this Good Samaritan, that helps you to understand how that story is to be seen. So, you have, who is my neighbor? You, you, don't, you, you get a story rather than a straight answer. A neighbor is who lives one to three miles away from you. You know, that would be a, a definition we may like. Not very close, not too far. You know, you have to be careful. You know? I want a specific description. And then exception clauses. If they're this and this and this and this, then they do not qualify as my neighbor. You know, that's what, and here we get this story instead as an answer to this question. But uh, that's what I would encourage you. Think about the literary context. Think about the beginning and the end of the story and try to understand what is the story talking about itself, the story, not its meaning. Uh, I think that that helps a lot in, um, in over-interpreting uh, uh, various parables. Uh, and let me go back to the example of the parable of the, the sower. Um, you can over-interpret that parable. But if you just look at the structure, Jesus speaks about people receiving the seed. It's something about receptivity to what God is doing. But we're going to let that stand. And then we look at the structure of that parable of the sower and you see that there are basically two types of soil in that story. There's receptive, well, let me change it around. There's the inhospitable 
soil, and that has various subcategories. And then there is the hospitable soil. Those are the two main things. So I would suggest to you, rather than to overinterpret, be careful as to what you do with a particular story in the parable of the sower, something about the seed. That's pretty emphasized because the seed is sown, 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 sown. So that's, that's a good thing that in the story itself, it's emphasized, it's featured. Inhospitable ground, very significant. Three subsections to it. Maybe we shouldn't be too detailed about that, but that's important. And then hospitable. So I would suggest to you, you've got three major emphases in the story. We don't know yet. No clue about the word. No clue about inhospitable. No clue about hospitable soil. But probably Jesus is emphasizing that. And then as you go to the interpretation of Jesus, which is one of the few parables that Jesus actually explains. You do see that that is one, those three are the major emphases in, in his interpretation. So that would be just the formal question. I'm going rather quickly because I'd like to hear questions and just to go into the examples of the parables in Mark 4 because you are currently looking through the Gospel of Mark uh, in terms of preaching and uh, in terms of your own study. So I said, look at the story. Try to get a feel for the emphases in the story. And then the next point would be, so what? What's, what's the moral of the story? What's the meaning? We have said that these stories, indicated by Jesus himself, want to be interpreted. We're not doing our own thing here. We are saying, this is a story, and I meant to try to find out what it uh, says. Um, and when you look at the meaning uh, of a parable, of a story, try to find out what does the word convey? Can I find anywhere indications? And I've given you one little hint in uh, the parable of the vin the, the good tenants, uh, the, the wicked tenants in Mark 12. When Jesus says there was an owner of a vineyard, if you don't think of Isaiah 5, you can search. Simply find in a concordance or a commentary or something, are there any other references to vineyard? Uh, this seems to be an important thing in this story. Is there a way to get from the story to what is intended. Do you understand? So we're moving out of the story into what is intended, but not in a random way. We don't say, mm, I think it means that. And I claim it. That's like my dad said, firmly presented is half proven. You know? So I just claim it. No, it's better to say, what, what indications are there to go from vineyard to Israel? because that's the connection there from the metaphor vineyard to the reality of a whole people of God, of all kinds of complexities in terms of the temple system and prayer in the synagogues. It, vineyard describes a huge thing, the whole apparatus of a theocracy of a, of a people of, of God. Um, so find ways to go from the story via known explanations. So if you have existing, pre-existing connections between a metaphor and what it signifies, then you are on good, good ground. Um, so uh, that would be a, an important part here um, uh, to move from the uh, uh, story to meaning. I've already said, look at the story's emphases and then try to see what is the meaning, what is the meaning that is conveyed? Sometimes it's very self-evident, or Jesus says it. Parable of the uh, soil, the sower, and the, the inhospitable and hospitable soil. Jesus explains, the inhospitable soil is like one who hears. Goes in, goes out. Hears with joy, problem gone. 
hears but then, how do I pay my bills? How do I make it through my marriage? How do I make it with my children? It's overwhelming. I'm getting choked by my life experiences. Third inhospitable soil. And then the hospitable soil that bears 30, 60, 100 fold, there is fruit growing out of that life that is not hindered by either in and out, quick, short fire, or the worries of life. That's clear then to make those connections justifiably from the story, soil, to heart. Going back to the story part of the parable of the sower, you may notice as you study just the story that agriculturally it's very unlikely to bear a hundredfold. You do some agricultural studies, you'll find out 30, that's manageable, 60 is pushing it. That's a fantastic harvest. I mean, imagine one seed, 60, but 100 is what would be called hyperbole, exaggeration. Now, that's a curious thing when you find that in stories, that there are elements of exaggeration. Jesus does those intentionally, just to push you over the edge and say, actually, the hundredfold shows you that you're not producing this. You're not the generator of this. Somehow the seed had a super, a Texan super type of a thing, and it moved you over the edge of what would be realistically expectable, namely what God works in and among us is beyond belief sometimes. Do you understand? So, so that's from story to uh, meaning. And I think it's good for us to keep those two levels separate and not to intermingle them, but to say, now I'm in the story part, now I'm in the meaning part. Now I'm going back to the story part just to give it clarity to yourself how you interpret it. I think that's good enough, uh, unless you have questions uh, from the definition of parables and then just a few little hints on how to interpret parables. I had intended for a few minutes to go through a few parables in Mark 4, just to uh, illustrate that a little bit because that's where you are currently um, and to interact. But if there are any questions, I, I'm always happy to listen to questions. There's no guarantee that I will give you an answer. In fact, the best way I can teach is to say, very good question, who would like to comment on that? <laughs> ba buys me time, and then I can kind of think, oh man, what am I gonna say to that? Yes, <laughs> yes. Did you say Jesus is only interpreting or explaining two parables, but then there were many that he brought with him? That's a good question. Did Jesus only interpret, uh, I need to feed that back for the um, uh, video thing. Uh, Jesus, uh, did he only interpret a few parables because the other ones were self-evident? Um, you are tempting me to go into a very difficult area. And it's basically at the very end. So I'm gonna, yes, no, I think, I, think, uh, I think that's very, very good. Uh, what you heard me correctly saying is there are very few parables that Jesus interprets. Why he does not give that interpretation, that's another question. Um, some of them are self-evident, I would, I would say that. Some of them have gr been grossly over-interpreted by great luminaries like St. Augustine. So uh, I wished Jesus would have given more explanations of his stories, uh, of his parables. Uh, that's maybe why we're here, just to be careful about it. So some of it is clear. A few are explained, and then there's a good body of parables where we need to maybe look at a book like Greg Blumberg's book on interpreting the parables, get a little bit of help, or Klein Snodgrass, if you like six, 700 page books. Klein Snodgrass interpreting the parables. But these are two major authors in the, in the um, more conservative evangelical world that would help us to kind of wrestle with that. So it's a complex issue, and one issue I'm ignoring, if we have time, we'll go back to that. Um, uh, 
good, good, good question. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you, you seem to be uh, for some team today. Yeah, I, I, can't I can't figure it out what soccer team you're, yeah. you're uh, going for, but, you know, <laughs> something. Since Jesus spoke so much in parables, should that be part of our lives? Well, let me give you a story. <laughs> that was not intended, okay? I got to teach in Germany this summer in Conta. It's a branch of Columbia International University Admission School. And guess who I had as a student? I had a converted Muslim from Damascus, Syria, who is a pastor of a Muslim church in Stuttgart, Germany. And guess what he said? You Western guys and girls, you don't tell enough stories. You're always talking about this concept and that idea. I've got to use stories. And so he brought that into our seminar all the time. You know, we would talk about this intellectual thing. He said, let me tell you a story about that. You know, he couldn't help himself. Uh, that's how he evangelizes. Many Muslims come to faith through his work. So the answer to your question is yes if you asked whether we should do more of it. Am I putting a question in your mouth? So anyway, I think that's, a, that's an important thing and it's kind of a self-correcting thing for me. I'm a terrible storyteller and I like propositions. I like the argumentation of Romans. It's it builds well, you know. But I realize part of life is not the proposition but it is it's the reality of the dynamic feel, personal involvement, being there with your heart, not just with your mind. So I think so. The problem I smell, though, is sometimes we could go overboard and just kind of go into our stories. What's your story? What's the Bible's story? We're all, all surrounded by stories, and then his story is lost. The actual fact, Jesus came to die. And it happened. It's not just a story. It happened. Or the Bible story, the story of redemption can hover like a, a rosy cloud, separate from the rain and the traffic out there. That's not good. So I'm saying yes, and I'm also saying let's be careful that we don't turn what is very solid witness and truth into nice stories that may help you in your life that would be wrong, okay? So we have to kind of find a good way there. But it's a very good, very good point and I need to grow in that, definitely. Okay, so um, uh, since I've successfully silenced all others, um, uh, daring perhaps to ask a question, um, uh, a few examples here. And I think I'm going to, I'm just gonna mention uh, the first one. There are three parables in this section, Mark 4 to uh, 421 to 32. Uh, they follow the parable of the sower. The three parables, two of them are clearly identified as kingdom parables. Jesus actually gives the introduction uh, formula. How can I compare the kingdom of God to? So, uh, 426 and 430, those two parables, they're kingdom parables. The first one doesn't have that formula on it, but most interpreters say, because of context, because they are connected with kingdom, that is also a kingdom parable. And uh, I don't want to overload you with content, and so I'm going to skip that first one, although it's very intriguing and also very difficult to interpret. I want to turn your attention to the second and the third parable there, namely the parable of the self-growing seed and the parable of the mustard seed to illustrate what we have thought about so far. Let's look at the parable of the self-growing seed, Mark 4, 26 to 29, and um, I don't know if we have time to read them, so as simply put, Jesus says, how can I compare the kingdom? When Jesus does that, he seems to say, it's hard to describe something of God 
within the parameters of agriculture, architecture, experience of life. It's hard. There's something different about God and our life. But let me try. And so one of them is this parable of the self-growing seed. It's basically a hyper-Calvinist sitting in his uh, Calvinist rocking chair. He threw out a seed into the this, into this soil. He's rocking on his hyper-Calvinist rocking chair, and the stuff grows out there. Automatos is the Greek word. We have our word automatic. Just sit in your rocking chair, pray, things will happen. Now, if you reduced the growth of the gospel to that, you would go awfully wrong. But there's something that Jesus is trying to characterize about how God's rule is going to take over in this world. A kingdom that shall never perish, that shall not be thwarted. The story has probably one point and that is this self-growing. So if you're a worrier, if you're a Martha, if you're a doer, if you are, you've got to be active, you've got at least to pray fervently, to, then that is a good parable for you to sit back, <clears throat> not in your hyper-Calvinist rocking chair, but to sit back under the word of Jesus and say, automatically. You see, so the story says something true because the farmer went out, he planted, but somehow there's this fruit growing. I mean, when my wife has her little vegetable seed and lettuce seeds, it's amazing how small those little things are. And they're really nice lettuces now. They come out. It's just a wondrous thing. So we are to marvel at that aspect of how God is going to do his rule from the story to the meaning and back. Uh, let's do the same thing with the other one, the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed is um, a, a parable of extremes. And the extreme is the story, very little, very big. It's basically what you get from the story. Now, it's again identified as a kingdom parable, so very little kingdom. Very big kingdom. Mustard seed was perhaps not scientifically the smallest seed. So you may, uh, is this historically true? Is this scientifically true? You know, But there was a proverb among Jews, and that said, as small as a mustard seed, the smallest seed. So proverbial maybe, not necessarily scientific, but even... If it were scientific, it's an extremely small little thing. And so this wonderful shrub that grows out of that, that protects and that gives shelter, that's an amazing thing that, that would come out of that small little thing. Moving from the story to the message. You wonder sometimes, with the rise of radical Islam, with the rise of new atheism, with the rise of radical atheistic scientific models, with the rise of indifference and uh, um, materialism, how is this concern of God, his rule, how is that going to fare? I'm dealing a lot with the European issue of radical Islamism, and it's scary. So, and there are clearly some of these radical Islamists, clearly there's a world dominance that is the goal. I need to hear from Jesus that that kingdom that is not by force and by sword, but by the power of God cannot be thwarted. It's not that I'm going to fight it well and I'm going to make it work against somebody else who is much more skilled strategically than I am. But it's going to, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen and that's the real mercy. It's not the great end. That's the mercy of this story. The mercy of this story is the mustard seed that you and I experience a lot today. It gets rained out. It gets overwhelmed by our concerns and cares. We, we can barely hold on the vision that here God is, is active and doing. 
we get, we get discouraged. And Jesus knows that discouragement and tells us that story and says, what's the seed? The tiny little one. But because it's of God, because it's God working, it will have a guaranteed glorious outcome. Not that you're going to live a triumphalist life. God is the triumph, not, not our lives. So here's a, here are two small stories that seek to encourage our hearts simply to anticipate well. We can't make too much out of these stories, but they certainly hold water for as much as I uh, gave you here. So um, I think we need to stop here. Uh, I, I feel tempted to go into that first parable as well. It's a little bit more tricky, but um, I, I'd like to still entertain some questions if there are. Uh, and then maybe go into that addendum to do justice to your question. Uh, yes? Yeah, my question is about the Sunday school question. Um, <laughs> you said that you would do that each time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You said that uh, these stories weren't coming from Mark, but uh, there is an inference here. And obviously, this how Mark, that Mark came up with the idea of when you have six or nine, yeah. you know, about seeds and they won't be seen again. Yeah. So far, I took you down the positive track, but there is a negative track to this. And I've just um, gleefully ignored that, except you already kind of admonished me, and now what can I do but face, <laughs> face the music. When a Old Testament prophet starts talking in parable, it's like an ambulance going down the road. It's a high alert siren, maybe even. I'm going to talk to you in stories because you're beyond hope. I'm going to give you a judgment speech. You are not hearing. You're not seeing. You are hard. And I'm going to cover you over with a story just to seal the deal. So parable speech as judgment speech, as a mode of concealment, completely alien to what we did justifiably in the beginning with the story that I gave you. So we're not wrong what we did, but I kind of was silenced, sil uh, silent on this other thing of why did Jesus speak in parables? What we did was all right, completely right. He does that with his disciples. He says those who are within, they receive the revelation of the mystery of the kingdom of God by means of these stories. But those who are outside, all things happen to them in parables. And the question is, for their enlightenment, for their eye-opening, or to be sealed? Uh, I've spoken of the parable of the tenants, the wicked tenant. Jesus tells the story, and I think that story has two fronts. One for us to hear and to pray. What are you saying? And one to convict. Because at the end of that parable, the opponents of Jesus, the uh, rulers of Jerusalem say, and when they heard this parable, they realized that he spoke about them and they sought to kill him. Oh man, talk about a judgment speech. You are hard-hardened you are doing your thing. You are going to kill the owner of the vineyard. And by golly, when they heard that, they said, amen, brother, preach it. We are going to get rid of you. Do you see? What, I mean, is there any room for repentance? For I cannot believe we touch the Holy One of Israel. I cannot believe that we're not stepping back and saying maybe our one God is three persons. Maybe the God that we worship is actually pleased with this one that is teaching us. And then we shouldn't touch the Holy One. We shouldn't kill life, the founder of life, as it says in Acts 3. So uh, that's a huge issue. And I do believe Jesus uses parables as a, like an Old Testament prophet who speaks in parables. And then Isaiah 6, 9 may be interpreted, maybe 
as finally convicting, finally hardening you all the way. Or it could be even in Isaiah 6, 9 that there is a hope for a turn. Now in Mark 4, 32, it says, he spoke in many parables to them that they may perhaps believe or something along those lines. There's a little bit, just a tiny, maybe that size window opening <laughs> in the in the sense of, wow, this is overwhelming, maybe there is still hope for, for turning. So that's a tough one to come down on. Um, I do believe that Jesus teaches some of the parables to convict and harden the hearts, uh, but I do believe that uh, Jesus himself, in the comment of Mark uh, 434, is saying, Perhaps, perhaps they hear the alarm bell and they may turn. So, but that's a hard one because some other interpreters would say, no, no, if you are opposed, you are hardened to opposition. Okay, so you, you um, uh, forced me to um, uh, go in there uh, into that difficult uh, aspect. Um, so it's a serious thing. But as we seek to follow Christ, it's a rich encouragement if we're careful, responsible interpreters, not over, not under interpret, and see that Jesus is doing pastoral ministry to us with our existential challenges and difficulties. I'm so glad Jesus spoke those parables about the future, about now, so that we would not be disheartened. Yes, please. Uh, uh, repeat that a little bit. I didn't quite hear it. Uh, could parables be just analogies as opposed to judgment speeches? Um, in, in, in some ways, um, parables do always draw analogies. There are these connections of the story to life. Um, uh, they are in the judgment speech, like Mark 12, that I mentioned to you, the, the wicked husbandman. They, uh, the analogy is meant to be understood and to be, to be um, taken as a judgment speech. So I would say, um, always analogy, sometimes judgment. That's how I would take that. Okay. One more question, if you do, otherwise I, I think it's wonderful. I can't believe you're, you're paying more attention than my average class and they're not on a lunch break, unless <laughs> some of our students may be on a permanent lunch break, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, please. No, it's not always, but it's conspicuous. I was once with a rather liberal theologian on a panel and he was speaking against the fact that these, um, these stories are actually going back to Jesus, or some of them. And I did say, you know, it's conspicuous that some of them, Jesus enters them and there's a convergence between the stories and his life. And they mutually reinforce each other. Jesus, the story, the story, how Jesus understood his own life. And he didn't quite have an answer for that at that point. But, so I would say some. And just kind of be aware of that as you listen to these parables, uh, how that may work out. So, not all. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I hope that I've encouraged you a little bit. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come here. It's been the first time to, to be here in the journey. And uh, time for one more. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs>
judgment, mm. let your mind be clear. No, that absolutely. My doctrine is real. Mm -hmm. There's an end mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. Well, I okay. I, I would encourage you maybe to think about a study Bible, NIV study Bible or ESV study Bible, which is the biblical text and then a good bit of interpretation. You do have that? Okay, uh, because I think that there is a good amount of help just to understand some of the stories. But to go back to your other question, I do believe that we need to pray sometimes we I do not know I do not know except to begin to use some of the parables of Jesus in your discourse maybe not with this particular person but otherwhere uh, elsewhere and I need to think which experiences in my life can be turned into a parable or a story, testimony, something that may transfer, that may hold a message. Uh, and I need to do work just telling the story and being aware. And it seems like you have a rich experience and background simply to harvest that. So we could practice it here. I think so. I think so, at least in the sense of telling the stories of Jesus, the parables of Jesus, and telling your own story, and maybe being more intentional in what kind of story should I tell, and how should I tell it, and I'm talking to myself mostly, those two things. But I have no understanding of a tool for that. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, and uh, it's good to see you.